Cybertruck reviews have been all over the spectrum, from glowing praise to vitriol and hatred. But I have owned seven electric cars over the last many, many years. I mean, heck, I ordered this one five years ago. But I got it a month ago. I've been driving it every day, and as an owner, boy, <laughs> do I have a lot of thoughts. <sighs> Let's talk interior quality. Teslas have never been known to have, how should I say this nicely, uh, very good interiors at all. Where other automakers will use piping and stitching and leather to suggest that certain trims are more expensive than others, Tesla has gone in the opposite direction. Ultra minimalism, simplicity, classic futuristic design. And well, for a long time, when Teslas were new, it actually worked pretty good. People got in here and thought, whoa, <laughs> I'm in a spaceship. But times change, even for Tesla. Go get in their cheapest Model 3, the new Highland Refresh, at any Tesla showroom, and you'll find that it is actually <laughs> really nice. There's stitching and leather and piping everywhere. It seems comparable to the 3 Series BMW and C-Class Mercedes that it's competing with. So I thought, oh, the Cybertruck, it's twice as much as the new Model 3. It's brand new. It's going to be fancy. What is this? Why does everything feel this way? It feels so cheap. The leather feels cheaper than what they use in the Model 3. Frankly, it feels the same as the soft touch material, which is just embarrassing. Those should never feel the same. There's hard plastic everywhere that not only would you find on, uh, well, cheaper, cheaper, cheaper trucks, but also cheaper vehicles. This isn't even present in less expensive Teslas. And the tech that you're used to seeing from the Model S and Model X cars still less expensive than the Cybertruck. It's just not present here. Auto opening and closing doors? Mm -mm, that's not a thing. The dash display for you to be able to see your speed? Nope, that's not here either. Funny, given that we have a yoke, but just wide open space. Yeah, sure, you've got a screen in the middle, and it is large. It's bigger than what you find in the Model 3 and Model Y. The resolution is nice. It looks pretty good. There's a little bit of dash display flex in the middle, but it's good. The issue is that, well, it doesn't rotate towards you like it does in the less expensive Model S and Model X. And that's particularly frustrating given that this rear view mirror, now it's useless. If the tunnel is closed, which is how Tesla recommends you drive the vehicle to get maximum range, your rear view mirror is completely blocked. This is useless. It's just a piece of glass. And so, well, then how do you see out of the back of your car? Ha! Well, the reverse camera. Yep, just that. If your lift gate's down, you're staring at the pavement. And if it's not, well, you just don't have a very good high quality feed. You have to put it over here where it's larger but kind of far away, or put it right here where it's tiny and not very nice at all. Oh, and I hope there's no rain while you're driving down the road because there is no rear camera washer. <laughs> and that lift gate just blasts it with dirt. So yeah, there have been moments where I can't see out of the back of my $100,000 truck. It's just nothing in here feels befitting its price. It creaks, it squeaks, it feels cheap. Okay, look, I know this is a foundation series. This isn't really going to be a $100,000 car for very long, but it's going to be an $80,000 car. It doesn't feel like that either. It feels like a $50,000 car from five years ago, because, well, that's what the Cybertruck was supposed to be. And you're supposed to pay attention to the road. You do, of course, but not everybody does. And that's why today's sponsor, the 70 My A510 dash cam, is about to be your car's new best friend. This thing is a true all-rounder with smart functions that you wouldn't expect from a dash cam, like lane departure warnings, forward collision warnings, and my favorite, leading vehicle departure alerts. Vehicle ahead motion detected. Now, in addition to those driver assist features, the A510 has built-in GPS, and it records trip time, speed, and coordinates, which is invaluable to police and insurance reporting in the event of an accident. The kit is easily user installed in any vehicle and can be paired with the rear camera for near 360 degree coverage dual recording. But my favorite part about the A510 is that it's always in standby and it records from the moment you turn on the car. Super handy. The footage is crystal clear both day and night thanks to the 3K Sony Starvis 2 HDR sensor, which provides the dynamic range that you need to collect important data, like license plate numbers. And events, well, they can be reviewed both on device using hardware buttons, thank you, or via the mobile app. 
recordings which you can even access remotely if you choose to add a SIM card to the dash cam itself. Handy, considering that the camera has 24-hour parking surveillance, offering collision detection when stationary. So, what are you waiting for? Get your new 70 My camera in the video description down below. Material quality aside, the packaging is exceptionally good in the Cybertruck. Let's start here. These rear doors open up to 90 degrees. This in conjunction with the rear seat bench that folds up flat, and you've got a ton of weather sealed storage space that you don't need to use tie downs for. Pretty dang cool. But let's say you need a little bit more room. We all do. You got a truck bed, tons of space, six feet. And what's great about this is like the cabin, this pretty much entirely keeps water out, even through car washes. And it supports up to 300 pounds, so you can walk on it or sunbathe. I don't know. The lift gate is easily deployed, and you will find that there are tie down points everywhere, not just here on the bed walls, front and back, but there's also tie down points here in the center of the bed. But you've also got these adjustable tie downs. You can buy more of these, it comes with a couple, and you can move them anywhere you want along this track. Super well thought out. Unfortunately, they're not quick adjustable. You need a screwdriver. I'll let it slide. My favorite feature, though, is probably the in-bed power outlets. A lot of electric cars have 120-volt inverters that allow you to get power out to AC devices. But this has a 50-amp, 240-volt power outlet, and it is actually able to sustain 50 amps continuous. That is amazing. I plugged in my Rivian with its mobile charger to this truck bed, and it was able to supply more power than my Rivian could even pull. That's phenomenal. So welders, pumps, whatever you can think of is going to work great on this thing. It makes it a really good sight truck. Headed inside, this touchscreen activated glove drawer is very, very nice. It's super easily accessible from the driver's seat and rather capacious. And while you have to frustratingly open it via the software menu, you can close it with just a nice shut. These cup holders are some of my favorite cup holders of any vehicle ever. They use these little grippy rubber bits that accommodate different drink sizes, small and large, and they don't rattle around when you're driving, which I really appreciate. There's an open center console area that is really, really great for bags, purses, and other things. It's very similar to my Rivian. Oh, and then there's power outlets and USB-C basically everywhere around the cabin. So that great stuff that's in the bed, that extends to this location as well. But you might not even need power outlets because of this display back here. Yes, you can play games, not Steam games. That's a failed promise from Elon. It's never coming to the Cybertruck. Thanks a lot for that. But there are a lot of movies. Movies are something the kids watch all the time while driving around the car. And while you can pump the audio through just the rear speakers, you can also choose to pump the audio through headphones, Bluetooth headphones, directly to the kids in the back. This is amazing for road trips when you're sick of hearing about Bluey. Blue is actually really great. Uh, Peppa Pig. There you go. All right. When you open up the climate menu, you will notice that there is yet again, as is custom in Tesla vehicles, a HEPA filtration system. It is fantastic at blocking out smells and weird, you know, particulates during fires. It's just fantastic. And when you're driving down the interstate and you see a bunch of pigs and livestock and you think, oh man, my car is going to smell, you can just pass right by it without any scent to be had. And you are going to be driving to pass those livestock and pigs because this is America, baby. USA! USA! Like all Teslas, there is no grab handle anywhere in the cabin. And while that might not be a big deal in a Model Y, in an alleged off-road truck, it very much is ridiculous. I've literally had to hold the car like this, which is insane. Just put a handle in. Come on. The sun visor is also equally awful. You might be able to tell here that there is actually space in between the sun visor itself and the headliner. So while this quirky, oddly designed sun visor in general is already a bit strange to deal with, there are times where the sun will come in between these two pieces, blasting you in the eyes with bright light. And so I literally have to do this. Fold it down, fold it down again, and then gently push it up because it feels like if I go more than that, it's gonna break. This is an insane design. Now look, are all of these things small on their own? Sure, but in aggregate, it just seems a little bit sloppy. Say what you will about the exterior appearance. It does look better in person, though I'm generally still not a fan. These doors, because they're stainless steel, 
are rugged. You can kick them, slap them, close them shut, and there's gonna be no damage at all, which is pretty darn cool. But the cool exterior features don't stop there. The tailgate is so softly sprung that you can shut it with a single finger, and it's soft closed too. The frunk, it no longer cuts off your fingers. Woohoo, great job. You can't fit a ton of things inside, but it does make for a nice seat. Oh, and these side view mirrors make up slightly for the sucky rear view mirror with really wide lane viewing. Also, they're heated, as is the wiper blade, steering wheel, and seats. Speaking of wiper blade, it is absurd, but it does in fact wipe as it so promises. Used in heavy rain, it's totally fine. I've had a couple storms, no problem whatsoever. The stainless steel exoskeleton does indeed stain. It looks like hell all the time, with bug guts and water spots and fingerprints all over. This is somewhat perpetuated by this push button entry design. You push the button, a peg pops the door panel out, and you've got to grab the door panel itself in order to open and shut it. It's like, hello, what was wrong with the common door handle? The rear seats lack headroom. This is really surprising to me because I've never had this issue in any other Tesla. Now, yes, I'm pretty tall at six foot four, but I am slouched over because if I were to sit up properly, my head would go through the roof. I think anyone over about 6'2 is gonna have their head touching the ceiling. And if you're over 5'10, 5'11, and you're on a bumpy road, you're gonna have a bad time. What's also a bad time? The noise that comes out of this ridiculous thing. So this center seat folds down. You have to use both hands in order to do it. Questionable design. And when it gets down, yes, you have two cup holders, but you also have this headrest that doesn't lock into position. It just sits there. And mine is squeaky. Okay, not all are gonna be squeaky. You could put some PTFE lube in there, but it's still moving back and forth all the time with the flow of the road. And eventually it's gonna come back and nothing is more grating than going 70 miles an hour on the freeway hearing this. One thing I also don't like back here, these little seat back pockets, they're not good. They're super cheap, they don't fit anything. And then if you do fit something that's an odd size, it will actually permanently change the shape of them. It dents the leather. Material quality extends to experience quality. And it's about time that we stop giving Tesla a pass on stuff that every other automaker would get slammed for. Tesla's not a young company anymore and the experience should reflect the price. Taking delivery of this thing was a nightmare. In theory, there's an app that's super easy. You walk through it, you never interface with a human, you pick up your car and everything's hunky-dory. That's not how it actually happens though. I was receiving SMS text messages from a delivery advisor that I could respond to, but then would go through the Tesla main support center. So there was like hours of delay every time I messaged to set up my actual delivery time. It never reflected in the app. When I said, hey, can you take it to the service center that's near me? They said, no, you have to come pick it up an hour and a half away. And then when I actually got out there, they were like, okay, sign the paperwork and we'll show you the car. And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to see the car first before I sign it away. And they said, ah, that's not really how we do it. Just sign it. We've got a seven day return window with a 1000 mile odometer limit. So as long as you stand to that, if there's any problems, well, you know, we'll take it back. But that's the problem. I get out to the car and the thing is filthy. There is dirt all over the bed and in the inside. The gaskets are misaligned. The captain's chair is squeaky. They didn't even look at this car before they pulled it off of the truck and put it in the parking lot ready for me to take delivery. And you know what the problem is? Is that if I were to make a big deal about it and say, no, I would like this cleaned. I would like a different one that doesn't squeak. They would just give that car to someone else. That's not part of the Tesla experience. It's getting really frustrating. It wasn't okay five years ago, and it's definitely not okay now. They're the only ones getting away with this, and it's got to stop. You said stop? One of the craziest things that you'll first notice getting inside the Cybertruck and driving it is this wheel. And not because it's a yoke, although that is an adjustment for most people. No, no. It is that this is a steer-by-wire system. This wheel is not attached to the wheels. And what's more bizarre than even that is that the steering ratio is much different from what you would expect in a regular car. Check this out. I am doing a U-turn left right now. That's as far as the wheel goes. Now check this out. I've done it in the other direction, U-turn again. This is as far as the wheel can possibly go, 360 degrees. And not only is the ratio much tighter, it's variable. So at these slow speeds, I get a fairly large output for the amount of input that I put well, 
in. But when I'm going 90 miles an hour down the freeway, I can make a much, much, much larger adjustment because it's lower sensitivity. It's probably safer. It's pretty cool, but it's also a really, really weird thing getting used to. Because not only do small inputs translate to larger outputs, the ratio is literally smaller, so it has to, but there's been a lot of drama about steering lag. Lag that does exist. It doesn't actually respond as fast as you do on the wheel, but I haven't really noticed that to be much of a problem because, well, frankly, you can only notice it because the wheel is so sensitive. So sure, if I turn like this, the car is a little bit slower to respond, but how often are you doing that? What I think is much more frustrating, and I don't know if it's a me problem or something that might be able to be fixed by software, but check this out. You see when you put the car in a certain position and you press the gas, the steering wheel tends to come back to home. It wants to be center. Well, that's not necessarily true in all positions on the cyber truck. Uh, in certain wheel positions, it just never returns to center. And that's what's really the most weird about this steering system, because it's a video game controller. It's not real. And unlike uh, playing Dirt Rally on a PlayStation controller from Thrustmaster, there's not really any force feedback. The steering wheel is dead. You do not feel the road. And what the wheels do on the car doesn't necessarily translate to the video game controller that is this wheel. So if you go over bumps and cracks and crowns on the road, or you hit a curb and it just completely stays directly straight. It's really, really weird because no other car works like that. <laughs> now in a sports car, that's a bad thing, but in a 7,000 pound truck, I don't actually hate it because what it means is that the steering is actually really responsive. You don't have to go hand over hand after hand, hand over hand over, to get the car to actually turn. Um, and it feels like the first time I ever drove an electric car. I get in a gas car now and I wait for the turbo lag to happen or there's an upshift and it's like the gas pedal isn't doing anything in an electric. It's just directly responsive. The same thing kind of holds true here in the Cybertruck. Again, no road feel. I don't want this in every car, but in this car, it's pretty nice. What makes it even crazier is that the real wheel steering, yes, the rear wheels can actually turn, amplifies this effect. This thing is incredible in parking lots. The turning circle is super, super narrow. Check this out. I am on a basically two lane highway. I am going to turn. And okay. I need like two and a half lanes, but this is pretty amazing given how absolutely enormous this truck is. And while you don't necessarily have the U-turn capabilities of a small sedan, you absolutely have the right turn capabilities of one. Check this out. This is a 7,000 pound truck. This should not be possible. And yet it very much is. But once you get past the steering wheel, what is this thing like to drive? Well, to give it the best compliment I can, it feels like a Tesla. <laughs> Benjamin, the man behind the camera, drives a Model 3 every day. He drove the Cybertruck and said, it kind of just feels like a Model 3, but like bigger. And that's what it is. Acceleration and regen is absolutely perfect, like it is in most other Teslas. Regen could be a little bit stronger, but it's pretty good. And handling inside of corners and uh, up canyons is surprisingly agile. The steering does make it feel a little bit dead. It feels a little bit unrealistic. You don't feel the car. You kind of hear it through the tires. But even that is a little bit difficult because of two huge things that have changed from basically every other Tesla that I love about the Cybertruck. One is the suspension. The suspension in this vehicle is incredible. Not for a sports car, but for the truck that it is. The air suspension and dampers are incredibly smooth. It handles potholes and rough roads like a, not a Rolls Royce, but like a Range Rover. <laughs> really, really good. It's not a sort sporty suspension at all. It's, it's very floaty. And even in its firmest suspension setting, it feels softer than the softest setting in many, many other vehicles. The softest setting in my Rivian is much firmer than the firmest setting in the Cybertruck. The other thing that is much improved that you might be able to pick up on right now is that the cabin noise is excellent. Teslas have always been not very well sealed. You get a bunch of noise from external cars, from the road itself. 
Not so in the Cybertruck. There is really good noise damping from the actual suspension components. And so you don't really hear the tires that much. You don't hear the suspension that much. When you're at a standstill, you can't hear anything. Cars next to you, it's like you are in a soundproof cabin. Part of that is the excellent glass that they've engineered on this vehicle. But beyond that, I think that it makes for an amazing environment when listening to music. The sound system in this car is exceptionally good. Teslas have always been very, very good in this regard, especially considering that they're rocking an in-house sound system rather than something from a name brand with mastering experience. Uh, it's really, really great. And the inbuilt system integration with Apple Music and Spotify and a bunch of other services, it continues to be class leading. No, there's no CarPlay but it's not often that I really feel like I miss it. One area where the cabin does get a little bit louder is on the freeway. Unfortunately, and this may be because of the rake of the windshield, get this thing up around 75, 80 miles an hour, and you do start to hear the wind. It is pretty noticeable. It's something that's better than most other Tesla vehicles, frankly, most other EVs, but is not going to hold a candle to any type of upper mid luxury you know, vehicle in this price range and in this size class. Uh, an F-150 is gonna be quieter if you get a Lariat trim than this. But at a standstill, we have traffic going 50 miles an hour in front of us. And if I turn off the HVAC system, you basically can't hear any of it. It's so cool. The wildest thing about the Cybertruck is that after a week, when I got used to the variable steering ratio, it didn't feel wild at all. It felt completely normal even the stupid little steering wheel buttons. That is until I pull up to a stoplight and every pedestrian and nearby vehicle looks at me. <laughs> this is not a Ford Raptor killer. There's no movement or feeling at all in the steering wheel. This is not a Ram 2500 killer. It doesn't have the towing capacity or the range for that. It's just an electric truck. But I don't even think that it's comparable to the Rivian R1T. Those are two completely different platforms with completely different ideologies and driving dynamic focuses. So what is this? Who is it for? Well, I think it's a truck for Tesla people. That might not be the truck that I want to drive every day, but it's a good truck. And as the price continues to drop, which I think it will, if we look at any vehicle that Tesla has sold in the past, it's, it's bound to happen. The less expensive this gets, the more compelling it's going to become for the average person. That is, if you're unlike me and can get past the design. It's a good car, one I would recommend. Just maybe not one that my heart is fully in. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay snazzy. Right turn! <laughs>